General Mick Ryan, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks, mate. It's great to be with you. It's great having you here, General Ryan. Um, you've written out this latest book, White Sun War, is what is it in the number of books that you've written? How many have you written total, including this one? That's uh, my second book that I've published by myself, but I've also published about five book chapters in, in other compilations as well. So this follows War Transformed. War Transformed was a nonfiction book. This is a fiction book. I'm going to ask you what the book's about. I mean, I've read it as well. Uh, but before I ask you about that, I'm curious, what led you to want to write a, a, a book, a fictional depiction of the conflict that seems to interest you most? And we'll get actually, I mean, you write a lot about the Ukraine war, which is ongoing. But what led you to want to write this book as a fiction, as a novel? Well, my main interest actually isn't any specific geography. It's war as a phenomenon. It's, you know, the, the character of war, which is changing due to technology and geopolitics and other things, but also its enduring nature. That is my first love um, and first interest, and it's why I wrote War Transformed. But this second book, White Sun War, really came out of my desire to apply the seven military trends that I described in War Transformed, as well as what I believe is the human heart of all wars, regardless of how technologically sophisticated they are. Ultimately, it is humans who decide to go to war. It's humans who make the key decisions in war. And it's humans who decide to end wars. And as we all know, it's humans who suffer the most in war. So why some war come out of me really wanting to apply uh everything I'd written about up until this point, including War Transform, in a narrative. And I wanted to use narrative because I think, firstly, um, it's easier to read for most people, but it's also something that's read more widely. Uh, and as Peter Singer likes to say, it's kind of like blending vegetables into your kid's milkshake. Uh, you learn things even when you don't really appreciate that you are. Mm. Yeah, I think that was, that's interesting. I was reflecting on that as well, which is that when you're reading a, a novel, you are in a position to absorb a lesson unconsciously, which doesn't happen if you're reading nonfiction. You know, so not only is it easier, but but that's the case too. And you wrote a lot about some of these more futuristic technologies and how they could be applied to the battlefield. That's also something we'll get into. So before we do that, I'm curious just on a broad level to learn a little bit more about you for our audience. Like, um, obviously, you've had a, a very long career in the in the military, I think somewhere between 35 to 40 years. You've served in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in East Timor. Um, tell us a little bit about what, you know, how how your career got started. And you, you talked about how you enjoy writing about war. I'm curious, what... It, how did your evolution and interest in the in in the military and in uh, strategy come about? Um, you know, I wanted to be a soldier for as long as I can remember. I think the only thing I ever wanted to be before that was an archaeologist, and that was after I saw Indiana Jones uh, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark when it first came out. But I've always wanted to be a soldier. Um, I've been one, was one from when I was 17 until February last year. Um, and for me, it was very much about uh, doing something, firstly, that was a service to my community and my country, I, I believe strongly in, in, in a service ethic. Um, and I was very lucky to have been selected for officer training and uh, graduated from the Royal Military College, Duntroon, uh, went and became a combat engineer and had an absolute ball for 35 years, one month and 12 days commanding and, and working with Australian and, and American and other countries, soldiers, sailors, airmen and women. Uh, and it was something that was tremendously satisfying, but it was also something that I believe deeply you had to master because at the end of the day, there are no silver medals in the profession of arms. You win or you're dead. Uh, and for me, that meant I had a very strict approach to my own professional development, uh, to mastering the profession of arms and ensuring those under me uh, equally were able to do the same because it's not an individual profession. This this is a collective one. It's a team profession and you have to master the profession as a team as well as as a leader. 
So that was, you know, one of my real driving forces throughout my career. And I was deeply fortunate to command at every level that matters in the Army, including mm. brigade, combat brigades, but also to have these operational experiences where you got to practice what you trained and been educated in, in East Timor, Iraq, Afghanistan, including command, but also to have a couple of really good postings in the United States. One was for two years with the Marines at Command and Staff College and School of Advanced Warfighting. Made a lot of great friends and learned a lot, but also a couple of years working in the Pentagon, uh, first foreigner ever to work in the National Military Command Centre and to study at Johns Hopkins. So all these things kind of rounded me out, kind of developed me from lots of different directions um, and only honed my appreciation for what a wonderful profession it is, but just how important it is to be really, really, really good at it if you want to bring as many of your soldiers home alive as possible. Mm. I love the comparison with um, Indiana Jones, you know, that, that speaks to the desire for adventure, which I guess is a common thing when you're young, right? Probably a reason that a lot of people join the military. Also, I, I'm struck by what you said about the stakes. I mean, the stakes are, like you say, um, life or death. Do you feel like that, um, not to get too far into this. This is the last question I have to do about, I have to ask about this, but when it comes to studying war and, and strategy, do you feel like that what makes this subject not only interesting to you, but interesting to other people is the stakes? And do you think that people really, how do you, maybe because you wrote a fiction novel, it's actually easier to convey the stakes to people, but I feel like that is something that's very difficult for people to get their head around when they read about this stuff or when they listen to podcasts to understand that we really are talking about not just life and death, but also like potentially on a very massive scale. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, I wrote War Transform well before Ukraine to kind of remind people that big destructive wars are still possible. Um, very few people alive have a memory of the huge stakes, the existential stakes that are involved in some of the wars that we've been involved in in the last 100 years. Um, and I think some of these new age theories about the decline of violence and the decline of war are just silly. Uh, I think they lack evidence. Uh, they're more hope uh, than reality because human nature just hasn't changed. And whilst it might be cyclical, when we go through these major conflagrations, we have gone through them for the entirety of human history. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that'll change. And Ukraine, I think, has been a big wake-up call to people. Didn't surprise me. I knew another big one was coming, and there's probably another big one coming in the Pacific at some point. But for a lot of people, they were deeply distressed and surprised, not so much at what they were seeing, although that was repulsive, what the Russians have been doing since their invasion. But they were surprised that this could actually happen. Mm. That, you know, we were supposed to be these sophisticated 21st century beings. How could we allow this to happen? Well, the reality is if you go back before all major wars, people felt exactly the same, that they were too smart to allow this to happen, that economic integration would not permit it, and it still happened anyway. So, you know, you can deter these things all you want, but if you're not prepared for them at the same time, you're really going to come undone and you could eventually not exist because of your lack of preparation. So I want to talk about that big one in the Pacific. When you say that people didn't believe that this could happen, are what do we what do we really mean or what do you really mean? Are we talking about a challenge to the existing order? Because we have obviously had wars and you fought in a number of them. So how, what is it do you think that people were so shocked by and was it primarily people in the west who were shocked but not necessarily Russians or Chinese? Well, I think people were shocked, first and foremost, that this could happen. I think they were shocked by the uh, brutality, the violence, the barbarity that we're seeing from the Russian side. Um, they were shocked by the massive loss of life and the massive consumption of equipment and munitions mm. that occurs in these kind of wars. Like, like I said, it's just not in the living memory of the vast majority of the inhabitants of this planet. Mm. Um, and therefore, a lot of people see it as something new, whereas the reality is it really is not new mm. at all. 
So let's talk about the book or let's get, let's begin to get into the book. The book is, I'll just high level st state a fictional portrayal of a battle for Taiwan. And um, there are many ways in which this can go. You, as I say, you, you introduce some futuristic technologies, not just that, but you also, I don't want to give, I, I don't know how I want to, what I want to say about the book, because I also don't want to give it, give it away because it is a thing where you don't necessarily want to know. Um, how it ends, because it has a very interesting ending um, that combines elements of climate change. It's very contemporary in a sense. Um, but how would you describe what the book is about and what um, sort of what your intentions were when you wrote it? It's, um, you know, the, the setting of a war over Taiwan is a framework for a larger conversation around several issues that I think are important. The first one is that humans make mistakes and national leaders miscalculate. I mean, most wars start because of miscalculations, whether it was Hitler in the Second World War, the Japanese in the Pacific War, the Russians in this war. All of their leaders miscalculated the will, the capacity of their adversary. And I think that is a really important conversation to have because when you see bellicose statements from people like President Xi, it's like there's a lot of assumptions being made there that generally don't play out in war. Uh, and, you know, we miscalculate uh, around the lengths of war. Everyone thinks they can go in and win these things quickly. Every generation falls for this fallacy. We saw it before World War I. We saw it in World War II. We saw it with shock and awe in Iraq, and we ended up being there for 10 or 15 years. Um, so, you know, I think this notion of human miscalculation is an important one. Now, the second one is that there's this overwhelming fascination with new technologies and war. And I understand that. I mean, they're really cool, right? Uh, whether it's hypersonics or AI or autonomous systems or just uh, missile magazine sizes on, on naval vessels, I understand people's fascination with these things because they're easy to appreciate. But the reality is there's no such thing as a technology that's ever won a war, never has. What wins mm. war is technologies that are combined with new or evolved ideas and organisations that are well-led. That's what wins wars. Mm. So I wanted to offset some of these technological discussions with the fact that you must combine technologies with ideas and organisations for them to have a successful impact in any kind of conflict or to, or, or to act as a deterrent. Um, a third area I really wanted to look at is, you know, the human nature of war, not just this element of miscalculation, but just how important leadership and teamwork is in not just military institutions, but any human organisation, you can't pay it off. Right? You have to pay attention to it. You have to invest in it. You have to be good at it. And where people aren't, you've got to get rid of them. Um, so throughout this book, there's you know different discussions between different leaders about their approach. Um, so you know that was another one of the themes I wanted to get at. I mean, so there's there's a whole lot of different elements to this. And the war over Taiwan is just a framework I use to pull out, uh, I think, some interesting concepts to do with military institutions and developing effective uh, military forces for the 21st century. How common is it for the initiators of a conflict to go into that conflict with the intention of keeping it short? Is that uh, more of a modern? Time. Is that more of a modern thing? I mean, we saw that with uh, Russia. We, okay. No, it's mm. it's a very very old idea. I mean, particularly before the first industrial revolution. I mean, in the medieval era, uh, kings and that were not interested in long wars because they were expensive. They had small populations who had to go in pull in harvests and these kind of things. So there's always been a desire to keep wars short if possible. Because, you know, no one, even the worst dictators, wants to go into a war and lose your national wealth and lose all your people. That's how you lose power. So it's a very old preoccupation, but we've become re-fascinated by it because we think modern technologies will help us achieve that. The reality is 
it almost never will. It, oh, was it harder to conclude wars in the past? Because they were so much longer. I mean, the Peloponnesian War was decades long. The Hundred Years War was 100 years. Or was the quality of that conflict different so that we we call it a war, but really it was the periods of pause in between um, conflict were so much greater than what we had, let's say, during World War II? No, there were wars. By the definition of a war is one side imposing its will or wanting to impose its will on another through the use of violence. And by that definition, you know, Kwerswich's definition, these were wars. Um, they may have been... Um, you know, low tempo, then have periods of high tempo. But how's that different to Afghanistan, which was 20 years of uh, generally low tempo operations? Um, so they may have used different technologies, but at the end of the day, you know, as Thucydides wrote, fear, honour, interests uh, drove humans want to want to impose their will on others through the use of violence. And that really hasn't changed. So what can you tell our listeners about how this book begins? And I have some very specific questions also about the the um, the certain technologies that feature in the book. I mean, some of them exist now. Um, they're just not necessarily used in this particular way. Some of them shocked even the participants in the book who weren't expecting them, which raises questions about, again, one, how realistic um, is or is it to expect technologies like the kinds that you, you describe in the book that we'll talk about on the battlefield in the time frame that you... Uh, put forward? And also, is it possible to really hide that kind of advanced development and manufacturing from your adversaries so that they are so surprised on the battlefield? Yeah, well, the book begins with a gross miscalculation, uh, I think is best to describe it. And it's set during an American election year. So no big um, surprises there. But at the same time, um, the US is dealing with a couple of really significant natural disasters. Um, but, you know, the type we're seeing, you know, we're seeing more intense hurricanes in the Atlantic and cyclones and typhoons in the Pacific. Um, and we'll see more of these things. So it's a combination of political and, and natural factors that uh, cause the Americans to be distracted, which then cause the Chinese to think there's an opportunity and therein lies the miscalculation. Um, so that's kind of how it starts. Uh, and, you know, you have to read it to see how, how it all ends. On the technology side of things, I mean, we do get surprised by technologies. I mean, um, you know, probably the most surprising technology for anyone was, um, you know, a Japanese citizen at Ground Zero at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. I mean, mm. that was a pretty significant technological surprise for the Japanese. Um, and there were surprises in the Second World War, whether it was jet aircraft or V-2 rockets, these were technological surprises. Um, and, you know, there have been other surprises with, te with technology throughout history. So I think it's realistic to expect there will be surprise through technology. Uh, it's also realistic to expect that the other side will adapt pretty quickly. I mean, humans are enormously innovative and adaptive when it comes to preserving their life. Um, and the rule of new technologies, if there is a surprise, the enemy generally is shocked for a while. And then the advantage of that surprise wears off as the adversary adapts around it. And we've seen this, what I call the adaptation battle, play out consistently through the Russo-Ukraine war. I mean, the Russians, I think, were pretty surprised by these um, maritime drones they were attacked with, but they've adapted around it. Mm. They were pretty surprised that the Ukrainians um, uh, adapted an old reconnaissance drone to strike Russian air bases deep inside Russia, but they've adapted around it. They were surprised by drone strikes in Moscow. So, mm. you know, surprise is an enduring element of war. Uh, you can do all you want to try and prevent it. But at the end of the day, you are going to get surprised. And when I talk to army units, as I still do, it's like try and prevent it, but you better be able to fight through it as well. Yeah, the American public learned a lot about that through the uh, war in uh, both the wars, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq, about adaptation and the evolutionary process that happens in war. We actually had one of your countrymen, David Kilcullen, on the podcast, uh, who was a special advisor to David Petraeus. So 
we got some insights on that there. In the book, what you describe as an invasion, there are various ways in which an invasion could unfold, but invasion isn't the only way in which the Chinese or the People's Liberation Army could uh, try to initiate some kind of uh, territorial action on Taiwan. What are the various scenarios that you could envision? I'm sure you can envision many, so that's not the best way of asking it. Um, what are some of the important ways in which a conflict could unfold that doesn't necessarily fit the traditional blueprint of people? And we can include, obviously, an invasion in this conversation. But like when you look at this, um, again, you've written about one particular way this could unfold, but what are the various ways in which something like this could happen? And how would we be in a position to recognize it, both the government and then also in terms of like the American people, the Australians, the Japanese, et cetera, the, the citizenry of these democracies to be able to understand that this is what we're dealing with? Yeah, there's, there's one particular chapter in the book where I have the Marines going through these different options and they talk them through everything from a blockade through to the different forms of physical invasion that might be possible or, or, or might take place. I mean, at the end of the day, the Chinese would prefer to take Taiwan, and I, I use that term deliberately. It's not take back. Taiwan has never been part of the People's Republic of China, and we need to make that clear. So they would be seizing Taiwan for the first time. Um, but they would prefer to do that without fighting. And I think, you know, the economic coercion approach is one thing the Chinese could potentially step up as well. I mean, there's a few people said, well, why didn't you use nukes? And it's like, well, the story would be over you know, in the first chapter. Um, and also, I don't want to normalise the use of nuclear weapons. Um, so I had to pick a scenario, and people can argue how realistic it is, but remember, it's a story that's designed to provide a framework to bring out important themes in military and strategic affairs. Yeah, well, there is actually a scene in the book where the participants are confused as to whether or not a nuclear weapon has been used on the battlefield. Um, which I guess, you know, is a way of introducing the concept without actually going full tilt on it. You know, when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, if the China, this is sort of me thinking this through, if the Chinese, if the Chinese were ready to initiate a plan, because that's the other thing that comes across in the book and in other conversations that I've had with people, which is that once, once they, if, if they, if they are determined to do this, it would make sense to try and take advantage of an of an opportunity when their adversary is either weak or internally divided. Another thing that comes up again in the book often is the, um, again, this is the perception of the Chinese. And I, I am curious to know, um, and this is probably a good time to ask you what you did to put yourself in the <clears throat> position of Chinese military planners. Um, who did you speak with to actually get that right afterwards? Did they read the book? Did they feel that it was realistic? But one of the things that comes across is the extent to which the adversary sees the internal divisions in Western democracies as a source of weakness that they can exploit. But like the Nancy Pelosi trip, I mean, if they were ready, let's say if we we follow all these assumptions, if they were ready, that could have been an opportunity to, to institute a blockade, right? Because it, it would have been this situation where they were responding to something. It wasn't clear if they were simply just responding and not necessarily escalating. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, that wasn't actually a question. It was just, it was an observation. Um, I don't know if yeah, you I mean, go ahead. Yeah. Huge, no, there's a huge, there's a huge amount of research that goes into this. Clearly did a lot of research for War Transformed and then a whole lot more for this book. Um, you know, the, the great thing about narrative is you just get to make stuff up. Uh, but even in making stuff up, you need to ground it in some form of uh, reality, you know, you need to create a universe which has a has a certain set of rules, and you know the rules generally are current technology plus about five or ten years for this. A uh, huge amount of reading and research into Chinese strategic culture and history, and you know, read more Xi speeches than you can poke a stick at. Uh, but at the end of the day, you do have to take liberties with reality when. You're writing a story like this. Uh, I think it would be true to say that no Western commentator academic really understands uh, the conversation that goes on behind closed doors in the Forbidden City. It's just something that we don't have 
real good insights into. So, you know, I, I've taken a few liberties in, in what I think might have happened uh, whilst trying to ground it in the kind of organisations like the CMC and, and others that exist right now. Is there a reason that you chose to make it very clear that the leadership in Beijing during this conflict would not be the same leadership that we have today? You didn't actually use fictional characters, but the implication was that this was a different uh, president that was overseeing. Is there is there a conscious reason that you did that? Yeah, I just I just thought that, you know, when people say at the moment, you know, say like, oh, if only Putin... Uh, wasn't on the scene, this war mm. would be over. And I just don't think that's true. Mm. You know, people might think if Xi moves on, it might be a different relationship, possibly, but it could be a worse one. So, you know, once again, it's about, you know, don't make assumptions about the uh, drive, about the internal calculus of human beings in national leadership. Sometimes they're prisoners of the system that they're in charge of, as well as this new president quickly finds himself when he comes to power. So I'm curious to understand what your conception is of a Chinese victory in this case. What would be, what would be besides, uh, I guess, um, wanting to, uh, what, what would be the high level goals of a, let's say Chinese invasion of Taiwan? How do you understand that? And how do you articulate it to people that are really not experts in this area? Well, they have a few different goals. I mean, the first goal, first and always for the Chinese Communist Party is the Chinese Communist Party stays in power. That is the first uh, goal always in everything they do. It guides every decision they make, especially these big ones. So, you know, this would uh, involve a political uh, takeover of Taiwan, where Taiwan is incorporated into the People's Republic of China for the first time. Uh, but beyond that, the strategic goals would be a breakdown in the US alliance system in the Western Pacific, uh, a degradation of US primacy in the Western Pacific. So China is the predominant power, um, I guess, west of the, uh, the international date line and the fracturing of US security relationships uh, in the region as well. So, you know, this isn't just about taking back Taiwan. This is about China, uh, in its mind, reassuming its preeminent place in Asia um, as part of it uh, wanting to have a preeminent place in global affairs. And what would victory look like for Taiwan and for the U.S. and its allies? And is that the same picture? Is what victory looks like for Taiwan the same thing as what victory looks like for the U.S.? Because no, I think I that's think very it it's very different in the case of Ukraine. I mean, what for what, what would satisfy U.S. military planners in, in the Ukraine war isn't necessarily what would satisfy Zelensky and the government in Kiev. Yeah, correct. And it'd be the same with Taiwan. I mean, I think uh, you know, I've recently been to Taiwan, got to talk to Admiral Lee Sin Min, who, who wrote the overall defence concept. And, you know, the whole aim, the military aim is for the Chinese to fail in, in an amphibious invasion. Uh, at the end of the day, victory for Taiwan is retaining its uh, political and economic sovereignty. Um, now, what that looks like in the wake of something like this would be difficult. China you can't tie, tow Taiwan into the middle of the Pacific to get away from China. It's still going to have a great, big, rich, powerful neighbour. Uh, but it would probably be a little uncomfortable for a while. Uh, for the United States, victory would kind of look like some of what Taiwan wants, but also some of what, what Japan wants, some of what Philippines wants, and some of what uh, the, the American public wants. And it would mm. be a melange of these things. I mean, for Taiwan... It's a very simple calculus, right? You either retain your sovereignty or you don't. For the Americans, it's a bit more complicated mm. because they have their own s strategic objectives, but they also have to work in an alliance framework or a framework with other countries in the Pacific that aren't allies that mm. are going to have an influence on how the Americans operate, where they operate, the kind of systems they use and the kind of outcomes that might be acceptable to bodies like ASEAN or individual countries.
Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed that part of the book. Um, we'll have a chance to talk about Australia and South Korea, but it's really Japan that um, is the most fascinating because there really is no analog for the Japanese, the, the role, the potential role that the Japanese can play in this conflict for, let's say, what we had in the case of Ukraine and Russia, a country that is not only economically capable, not only militarily capable with a really powerful navy and proximity in terms of its ability to, to serve as a base, but also a motivation, you know, I mean, like the Germans weren't, let's say, motivated on the scale of the poll of the Poles to to resist or fund or um, send military arms to Ukraine. But the Japanese, because of their historical relationship with China and China's grievances towards the Japanese are, are motivated to, to really kind of see the long term arc of this conflict. I'm really glad that you brought up the overall defense concept. Was that published in 2018 or 2017? 2017, uh, when Admiral Lee Sin Min was the chief of general staff of the Taiwanese armed forces. So for years, the Taiwanese have had um, a strategy, as I understand it, that was kind of uh, informed by the legacy status of the island relative to the to the mainland and the fact that it had the ability to to try and prepare for a conventional conflict because they had the support of the Americans, they had a lot of money. But over the years, the, ch the spending in China, the size of the country, all that stuff has uh, overwhelmed their ability to contend on a sort of even basis. And so this strategy is intended to fight a more asymmetric war. What what can you tell us about this, uh, this strategic approach and how significant it is for uh, the defense of Taiwan and and how um, how far the lessons of the report and the strategy have been implemented thus far in their armed forces? Well, you know, after Admiral Lisa Min left as a chief of general staff, I mean, there wasn't a lot of implementation because there's a deep legacy of conventional capabilities. And it's not just about tradition or, or wanting, you know, the traditional service pie of funding. We need to remember that uh, before a war breaks out, Taiwan still needs to try and deter, you know, Chinese adventurism. It needs to respond to constant Chinese mm. uh, incursions in its airspace and in its maritime uh, spaces across the, you know, the, the midway line in the Taiwan Strait. And you can't always do that with asymmetric capabilities. You can't intercept aircraft coming into your ADIS with most of the drones that exist. You can't intercept uh, Chinese Coast Guard ships that come into your territorial waters with sea mines. And this is at the heart of the overall defence concept is it's not just about asymmetric capabilities. It's a mix of conventional and other capabilities that provide Taiwan with the capability to respond to hybrid threats pre-war, mm. Uh, two, to provide comfort to the citizens of Taiwan that they are being defended. And we shouldn't forget just how important that is. Remember, there's 25 million Taiwanese citizens who want to see their military as being able to protect them. And you just mm. can't always do that with sea mines, AI and autonomous systems. Uh, and then you need the capability to respond uh, if the worst happens and not just respond, but to protect yourself. So the overall defence concept is mm. far more sophisticated than a few mines and a few autonomous systems and a few missiles. It seeks to balance these deterrence pre-war war imperatives whilst really ensuring the Chinese can't lodge. And if they lodge, the lodgement is defeated. Um, and, and it describes, you know, these these key phases of the war. You know, the first mm. one is force protection. You've got to preserve your force. The second one is defeat the Chinese in a littoral battle, then fight them in the beachhead battle. And then there's the homeland defence battle where you have a nation in arms, kind of like the territorial defence forces Ukrainians have. So they're the four key f phases. Um, you know, for me, that make a lot of sense. And I think a lot of other countries, including my own, own should look at it quite seriously when it comes to defence for structure planning and, and, and procurement and training and, and leadership. How hard is it, how hard would it be for the Chinese to establish a beachhead? Um, and how important is it 
that the Taiwanese try and prevent that from happening or attack Chinese forces relentlessly in order to degrade them as much as possible in, the, in that process? Extraordinarily hard. I mean, this is a mega maths problem at the end of the day. Um, if you have a look at the American study called Operation Causeway for the invasion of Formosa uh, in the late, sorry, the mid 1940s. And the Japanese uh, controlled the island. 90, that's right. So there's about 90,000 Japanese, of which 39,000 were ground combat troops. The US assessed it needed 200,000 troops ashore. Now, the Taiwanese have a defense force of a couple hundred thousand now. Um, and the Chinese would have to put ashore in the first wave something in the order of one to 200,000 troops to really guarantee it could get at least one beachhead secure. It just doesn't have the shipping to do that uh, and at least to guarantee it. So, you know, this is a massive maths and logistics problem that I don't think the Chinese have solved at the moment. And we should remember that, you know, the D-Day landings, which we've just commemorated again in early June, was undertaken by the most experienced invasion force in the history of mankind. They had done North Africa. They had done Sicily. They have done Italy. They'd done dozens of Pacific landings. And still, they weren't sure whether they would succeed. Remember, Eisenhower carried around with him a letter uh, accepting responsibility for its failure. And this is the most experienced invasion force in the history of humankind. So, you know... I don't think the Chinese are up to it just yet. They're certainly good at beating their chests, but this is an extraordinarily difficult undertaking across 100 miles of sea uh, against Taiwanese, probably Americans and Japanese who are going to do everything they can to kill those ships with Chinese soldiers on them. How important are ground forces in that initial assault from on the part of the, the Taiwanese for defending it? And does it have to be a port or can the Chinese initially capture an airfield and hold it? Is that an option? Well, it's probably a mix of both and, and, and a few other things as well. But, you know, one of the reasons I focused on ground forces in this story is because all these war games you read about are all about air and sea campaigns. And it's like, well, OK, got it. You, you got that. But what next? You know, we have a history of planning and then stopping before decisive phases in war. And Iraq was a classic. You know, we plan for the invasion, but what happens when you own it? No planning. Uh, mm. And I think Taiwan's the same. What happens when you actually got to fight on it? You know, there's this big green thing called Taiwan. Uh, at the end of the day, you can't win a war over Taiwan without having people on the ground. It's where the people live and it's where the politicians are. It's where wars are actually settled. So, you know, Air Force and Navies fight wars, but armies win them ultimately. So you have to have a look at this. How would the Chinese get troops ashore? I mean, multiple different ways uh, in multiple different areas through airborne landings, amphibious landings. They might try and seize a port, but we know that's hard. Uh, they might have to take their own port with them like the Allies did for Normandy. Um, but this is an extraordinarily complex and difficult undertaking um, the Chinese have only had large-scale joint theatre command headquarters for less than a decade. Uh, we've been doing it for multiple decades, mm. and it's still really difficult. Yeah, I mean, that that is also an important point, which is that we have experience, they don't. But we also, in the past, have fought protracted conflicts like this with a much more reliable, robust industrial base. How important are concerns about America's industrial capacity and our ability to sustain a prolonged conflict relative to the Chinese? Well, I think that's one part of the problem. It's an important part. Um, so industrial base is important, but stock holdings even before that is vital. I mean, what have you got in stock to fight with now? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, to replace that and build on it is your industrial base. Uh, but also, what's your shipping capacity? I mean, if you have a look at the Central Pacific campaign led by Nimitz in the Second World War, that had a fleet train of thousands of ships, thousands of troop carriers, oilers, cargo ships, these kind of things. Um, you're going to need a massive civil shipping capacity that outstrips 
the capacity of the US Navy, the Japanese Navy, the Canadian Navy, the Australian Navy all put together. So industrial base is vital. Stockholdings now is vital, but the transportation connectors um, and the intermediate logistic hubs, these um, alliance bastions that I talk about in the book, will also be really, really vital. So the stock holding actually brings up an opportunity to compare this potential conflict to Ukraine, because there's some like really important differences, right? Um, the the U.S. had the luxury, it seems. Again, I'm coming at this really a, as a non. Clearly, it should be obvious to everyone that I'm, I have no expertise in this whatsoever. But um, it seems that the that the U.S. had the luxury to be able to sit by and allow this invasion to occur. And then it could sort it could not only allow it to occur, but observe how the Ukrainians were performing, what the how the leadership in Kiev responded. And they had the luxury of being able to support and 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 uh, ramp up their support of the war midstream. It seems that in the case of Taiwan, because it's an island, because it could be choked off, that supply getting getting the supplies to the island, getting it prepared ahead of any potential conflict is much more important. For Taiwan, that is for Ukraine. Um, is that true? How important is that? And uh, what is being done to prepare the Taiwanese? And and what are those key differences between Ukraine and Taiwan as far as this is concerned? Well, the Ukrainians post twenty fourteen really stepped up their game when it come to preparing for conflict. I mean, like the Taiwanese, they had the I would call it luxury, but they knew who their enemy was. They knew there was only one country that they were probably going to fight. For Taiwan, it's the Chinese. For the Ukrainians, it was the Russians. Um, they, you know, had uh, undertaken a range of institutional reforms around better aligning with NATO, around their higher command and control, having a def civilian defence minister and a military commander-in-chief was new, Um and their stock holdings were pretty high. I mean, they had about three months of war stocks at the beginning of the war. And remember, they went into this war with 900 main battle tanks. Now, that's more than the rest of Europe combined, except for the Poles, of course, who also understand what a dastardly breed the Russians are. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure what the Taiwanese stock holdings are, but when they use them, it's going to be far more difficult to supply them. Um you know, you've got to traverse thousands of miles of ocean to get there, whereas for Ukraine, you just hop across the border from Poland. Um, and I think, you know, the role of Poland for Ukraine is probably similar to what Japan would be for Taiwan. There's not a, a direct comparison, but very similar. Both are countries that uh, understand the rapacious, brutal nature of the adversary. Both have fought them before. I mean, the Chinese and Japanese have fought before, the Russians have you know, treated the Poles terribly throughout their history. Um, so, you know, there are some comparisons there uh, around geographically close countries that would be very important in a future conflict. So similarly, how important would it be that the United States respond early in this case? How much more important is it that the United States respond early and not sit by and observe? I mean, what, because, again, of the fact that it's an island and also... We have, we have, we don't have a formal alliance like NATO in in Asia, so there would need to be maybe stronger signaling on the part of the U.S. that this is going to actually that they're going to defend the island. Well, I, you know, I have heard this argument before. At the end of the day, the U.S. has been working with Taiwan for decades to deter China uh, over this scenario and others that are threats to the sovereignty of Taiwan. Uh, the U.S. essentially had no relationship with Ukraine before the war and look how much has it supported it. So, you know, I, I think the U U.S. sitting back and watching this happen argument just doesn't hold any water. I think the U.S. would be working even harder and is working harder to ensure that this doesn't happen, to try and deter it as much as possible. And that's why Anthony Blinken is in Beijing as we're speaking right now. It's not just about closer relationships between the US and China. It's about deterring these kind of catastrophic wars that might come about through misunderstanding, through not having the kind of uh, 
uh, red lines and the guide rails and a relationship that the US and the Soviet Union had throughout the Cold War. So I think, you know, the US is invested in Taiwan remaining sovereign. Um, and if it didn't, I think the US understands that most countries in Asia might look at it very, very differently in including the development of their own sovereign nuclear programs. Hmm. So General Ryan, I'm going to move us to the second part of this conversation. I have some very specific questions I want to ask you. One of them at the very top of the list is really trying to get a sense of how devastating this conflict would be, even in a base case, in terms of casualties for not just the Chinese and the Taiwanese, but for the Americans and any other allies that um, would choose to participate. Also, that raises a question of like, you know, how realistic is it to depend on certain countries for support? What kind of def support is appropriate to expect? Uh, without, let's say, the Japanese support, would the United States be able to defend Taiwan? Can it rely on its bases? Um, can it what, for example, we recently had a storm in Guam. I know uh, people um, on the island who talked about really how unprepared it was for that kind of devastation. Um, you know, that's a, that's another question I have. Also, specific questions about um, submarine warfare and also the importance of convincing the CCP that the United States can actually bear the costs of a prolonged conflict seems to me to be right up there. Um, again, in the book, you talk about the awareness that Beijing has around internal divisions in Western democracies and their exploitability. And there's a lot of open concern still about how long will the United States continue to support Ukraine? How much is that dependent? How much is there is a is there a, a cross party consensus on that, or is it an exploitable issue um, in in any kind of political campaign? Um, and then hopefully we'll have a chance also to talk a little bit about some of these technologies that you use in the book. I mean, VR is one that people are familiar with. It's now Apple has released released their headset. It played a big role in the book, and there's some other ones. Again, I don't want to. I don't want to necessarily um, call them out, but I'd be curious. There's one in particular that uh, I kind of mentioned earlier in the conversation that I want to ask you about. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with General Ryan, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. General Ryan, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed.